Good afternoon, everybody. Um, hi, I'm Smith Mordack. I'm a Director of Sustainability and Physics at Bureau Happold and also an RBA councillor and a member of the RBA National Awards panel. Um, so welcome to this Building Stories talk. This is a new series where we celebrate RBA award-winning buildings and invite the architects to share their experiences. We can all learn from seeing the innovation, careful thought and hard work that goes into these projects, whatever their scale. So today I am delighted to be joined by Tristan Wigfall from Almanac and John Pardy from John Pardy Architects, who will be telling us about two projects designed for private clients. So um, please do send in your questions at any time for our Q&A later. Um, and without further ado, um, Almanac's House Within a House is a detached family home in a London conservation area. It's originally built in 1957 as a replacement for a bomb damaged semi-detached home. And the house came to look incongruous and uninspiring compared to other properties along the same street. Um, Almanac's brief was to transform it into suitable living quarters for a couple with uh, not one, not two, but not three, not four, but five young sons. So brilliant brief. We'll uh, hear more about that. Um, so let's hand over to Tristan Wigfall to tell us all about it. Tristan. Thanks very much, Smith. Uh, so yes, I'm going to spend about the next 15 or 20 minutes running through quite a few slides uh, to do exactly that, try and tell the story of the project and I guess go beyond uh, some of the, the polished pictures you see maybe uh, and give the kind of background to the project. So um, here we are in a uh, leafy corner of uh, southeast London uh, in an area called Broccoli uh, and it's an interesting area historically. It uh, emerged in the kind of early 1800s with the expansion of the railways uh, and then in the 1850s a wealthy family within the area uh, played an instrumental part in the kind of development of these very characteristic um, uh, semi-detached villas um, that were that, that populated the area. And you may be able to pick out just in the middle of that photo is our site as it was in around 2015. Um, and as mentioned, it, it had been bomber damaged. So originally it would have been a mirror to the, the building you can see on the right. And um, as quite common to um, areas across London and wider, uh, it was significantly damaged during the Second World War. Um, and actually they, they've got records of about 17 V1 bombs and five V2 rockets. So you can kind of get a picture of quite what that damage would have uh, inflicted on the streets. And this is a kind of uh, extract from the LCC bomb damage map to the nearby area. You can kind of see the areas of black there where whole sections of streets were completely obliterated during the bombing campaigns. Um, so it just kind of paints a picture of, the, of that scene. Uh, so to our site specifically, we don't know exactly when it was um, uh, damaged by the bombs, but at some point during the Second World War, it was damaged beyond repair, as was the area just across the road from it. You can see there was later 1980s buildings put in. Um, and while we don't know exactly what happened, we've got historical records locally. So this is on a nearby street on Breakspears Road, where you can kind of see, get a, a much clearer picture of the, the damage that must have been inflicted. And, and also try and get a picture of the, the process of the reconstruction after the war that must have taken place. Um, so what we do know, and it's, it's still part of the deeds of the, the property, um, is that um, the War Damage Commission paid out uh, to the then owner uh, £744 compensation for that damage. So in today's money, that's about £30,000, um, which you can see wouldn't really have gone as far as trying to reconstruct what was there before. Um, and it was that incongruous 1950s dwelling that went in its place that caught our client's eye. Um, they'd been looking in the area for some time uh, for, a, I guess, a project um, to take on. Uh, as Smith mentioned at the start, you know, they they had a large family to try and accommodate. So uh, that kind of began to set the scene of what they needed to find from both the site and the property. And these are the actual estate agents listing photos from the time. So you can kind of see they had imagination to um, to really see beyond uh, the fabric of what was there at the moment and what they might be able to create with it. Um, it had been rented out for, for many years, so it was sort of on the state of almost falling into disrepair. Um, but within, within that context, they could see there was the potential to expand, um, so both at the rear and at the side and above. Um, and, and it was with that in mind that they set to work on trying to see what they could do with the site. Um, the father of one of the clients 
is in the construction industry as a quantity surveyor. So they had quite a lot of contacts um, to work with initially, but they're actually based up in, in Scotland. Um, so the, the first architect they engaged was based in Fife and they drew up the preliminary plans. And, and while they kind of functionally definitely met with the, the brief um, in terms of spatial requirements, delivering kind of six bedrooms and building on what was there already, I think they'd kind of slightly missed the the nuance and the the sensitivity of of the conservation area, and trying to work something that would be acceptable to both the planners and the local community. Um, and equally, I think the clients very enthusiastically started uh, kind of pulling the property apart internally while the planning process was going on, um, and uh, you know stripping it out and actually starting the first fix, just potentially underestimating the the planning journey that that lay ahead of them. Um, and it was at that point that the kind of the breaks went on a bit. Um, the, uh, the, the, the responses from the local neighbours were not wholly positive. Um, they weren't very keen on what was proposed. And I think that was then in turn reflected in the, uh, the planning officer's comments and the heritage officer. Um, you know, they just felt this uh, square box didn't fit comfortably within the, 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 con the context and um, critically, it, you know, it just didn't add anything to the, the conservation area. Um, and for that reason, they kind of knew they had to rethink their approach um, and effectively go back to square one. So they started talking to architects that were a bit more locally based to the project who maybe had a, a better understanding of the kind of planning context and, and the area itself. Um, and we met with them down on site in, it was around late 2016, so some time ago. And they had a very clear brief, um, which was immediately quite interesting to us. Um, you, you know, the idea of creating a, a very large house um, and some of the preliminary things they were saying about, you know, working with long non-luxury materials. Uh, and, and from the outset, it was clear that they were keen to work with the existing structure um, and the existing building. I think, you know, potentially a more cutthroat developer might just have tried to clear the site straight away and start afresh but it was in their brief from the outset to try and work with it and I, that was exciting for us um, to, to try and take on that challenge. So we were instructed uh, to get to work and uh, did our kind of as with all our projects kind of preliminary assessment of the site looking at the constraints and opportunities that, um, that the site gave us um, and just really starting to think about how we could unlock it um, because of the history of what had happened before with the planning, um, you know, unlock it so it would meet the client's brief and then also meet the, the requirements and the expectations of the planners. Um, and we had that quite kind of um, detailed history of the kind of recent planning application and the feedback that that had received um, on which to build. And also what was critical from the outset being in a conservation area was to engage with the conservation area society um, so there's quite a rich and active conservation area society in broccoli the broccoli society and we saw that as a positive thing um, you know engaging with them from an early stage uh, involving them in the design process and they were actually very forward looking um, they, they weren't kind of stuck in the past they were interested in innovation and, and having design-led schemes that could kind of uh, enhance and and uh, add to the conservation area and not just be stuck with a foot in the past. Um, because in some senses, if you look at this very crude mirroring of the original house, the planners might be saying, this is what we should be doing, and that there are actually examples of similar bomb-damaged houses in the area where um, there was much, where the sites had already been cleared um, and they, this, the planners were much more rigid in saying that we, it needed to replicate the original mirror. And I think that's where we began to see the potential of, of working with the existing from a planning perspective, because it actually, I think, ultimately gave us a bit more license, um, because arguably anything we did to the kind of incongruous box that sat there could have been argued to be enhancing and, and improving what was there. And so we, we saw that as a virtue um, in order to begin to test our ideas. Um, we did very quick early stage kind of massing, kind of beginning to feel our way of, of what might sit comfortably on the site and, and really building on the original uh, concept that the, the clients had already set up uh, in terms of their spatial requirements. Um, but it was quite a gut reaction of, of how we wanted to approach the site. We knew we couldn't mirror exactly the original building um, to the right of the, the site. And in doing so, 
we wanted to see what we could do that could kind of mediate between the two. Um, so a way of kind of comfortably sitting between these two quite uh, architecturally strong uh, buildings either side. And it was that that resulted in this kind of asymmetrical uh, facade and, and roof form. And the next few slides are the, the very first feasibility images uh, that we presented to the client. And one of the constraints of, of working with that existing building was that the, the levels just didn't correspond with the neighbouring Victorian uh, properties where they had very elevated floor to ceiling heights. So by retaining the ground and first floor, it meant we met, we ended up with this kind of very enlarged second floor level. But we felt that could really be a positive aspect to the project, you know, of revealing this element as you came worked your way up through the building. So building up the plan, um, we we had these ideas of uh, kind of just following the client's brief uh, with the kind of layout of the spaces, uh, the social areas at the ground floor in order to put, uh, accommodate the large family. Um, up at the first floor level, we largely retained all of the existing. Um, I'm sorry if you can hear some tapping in the background. I'm sitting under a roof light and it's raining, um, so apologies about that. Um, yeah, so first floor, we uh, largely retained as much as possible. We even kept the stair in the same position so as not to completely unpack, unpick the um, structure. And then up at the second floor level, um, an early stage, we, we instructed structural surveys to um, check that there was capacity within the original foundations to take um, a new story on top. Um, these were the very early stage kind of facade studies that we developed for conversation with the Conservation Area Society and the pre-application process. And they were positively received, so we, we knew we had a good footing on which to build our approach and the design. Um, and materially as well, we began to work up a palette. Um, we knew from the outset we were going to try and create quite contemporary materials that would complement um, the existing, but not uh, try and mimic exactly the weathered stock, London stock brick. Um, and that was quite a key conversation uh, with the planners. We had brick panels made up took them down to site to make sure they kind of uh, accepted our rationale for not trying to replicate exactly um, what was there on the adjoining property. Um, and one of the constraints of working with that existing structure um, was it meant we knew we couldn't replicate exactly the neighbouring house um, and we knew we couldn't kind of recreate the stucco um, in, in, so it didn't appear like kind of icing on top. So it was really a kind of a relief study uh, of kind of playing with the the stepping of the brick and the apertures and this point in the process was quite an engaged we had to go in for another pre-application with the planners uh, an engaged process where they were kind of very much trying to steer us in certain directions um, and it was through that that we this kind of bay form emerged in the facade uh, and working closely with the client they had a very kind of creative and playful approach um, in working on it and we tried to subvert it um, so we created a kind of an inverted bay um, and it was with this where we felt we'd taken on the planners kind of comments but uh, with our own kind of stamp on it that we went into our full planning application uh, and this progressed really well it was well received locally um, but it was just at the 11th hour where the the planners kind of picked up on the fact that we'd inverted the bay and they basically gave an ultimatum they would say you know, you've got to revert back to the, the more standard bay projection uh, or we will refuse. So I think it was through gritted teeth that the, the clients really said, OK, we, we don't want to go to appeal at this stage, having already gone through multiple planning. So we successfully got the planning approved in, in uh, spring of that year. Um, and of having gone through a detailed design process, um, we knew that the client was going to project manage it themselves. Um, so we'd kind of been tried to be very rigorous in developing our detailed design because we knew we were going to effectively have to hand it over. Um, again, drawing on their Scottish uh, connections, uh, the client found a contractor that came down um, again from Scotland. It was a fantastic Davian Duval who uh, set to work on pulling apart the building. Uh, and that's towards the end of uh, 2017 when the roof's been taken off the building and the scaffold's gone up and you can see the client on the right there kind of probably feeling a little bit daunted by the process that lay ahead of them. Um, and uh, I think it was really exciting for them to, to kind of finally be getting going on the project, but also very much open to scrutiny of all of the neighbouring passers-by. Um, and this was an early stage visit to site. We were somewhat at arm's length because we weren't directly managing the project on site. 
Um, but it was very exciting seeing it emerge. And the client had a really great Instagram feed going through the process so we could keep a track of it from afar. Um, but you could begin to see this kind of shrouded form emerging underneath the scaffolding. And that new timber structure that came on top um, kind of had the feel of almost you know, an upturned uh, hull of a boat, of a boat and the, the elevated um, heights, you know, it's about four and a half meters up to the apex beam there. Um, and always getting a sense for um, how we were wrapping the building, um, in, enshrining it in this new skin that wrapped around it. Uh, and you can see the new brickwork going around and on the right there, very much how we're kind of splicing our new structure into the existing, with those existing floor joists. Um, some of the detailing and on the right there, you can see where the, um, the, uh, the big reveal of the scaffold started coming down at the rear and at the front. And it's always a kind of hold your breath moment. Um, particularly how it was going to be received locally. Um, so just to walk through the plans very quickly, um, what we've done here is you can kind of see the grey areas, so all the parts of the building that are retained. Um, you also get a sense for the kind of thickness of the walls, um, where you've got your solid brick walls, and, and then we're overwrapping and insulating on the outside of that. Um, up on the top floor, you know, the additional three bedrooms and two bathrooms that was added. Um, the facades, there was some brick detailing that went in, there's, there's soldier coursing that went around to try and draw you around to that entrance, but it was slight nuance to have the entrance around on the side of the property um, and the rear elevation and the change of the material down at ground level with the timber as opposed to the brick and softening it. So I think it was in uh, early 2018 when the clients moved in, um, there was still works complete to complete on the inside um, in terms of final finishes and, and joinery. Um, as well as the external landscaping. Um, and this is when we visited in, I think it was actually 2019 now. And I think it, I always like looking at these photos next to each other just to kind of remind us of, of where the site was and, and the fact that it's still there in place and, and the kind of transformation that um, took place. And it's 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 really softening in, I think, on the site. Obviously, there's a kind of ghostly appearance of the of the brickwork, um, but it's there's some nice moments as you approach it from the different angles in the context of the kind of historic buildings. I'll flick through some of these uh, interior photos. So that's the main social spaces. We step down at the rear. All of the new areas have this kind of new top hat with the exposed roof structure and the rear elevation. Um, the stair, as I say, was kept in the same position, but kind of ribbons through the, the volume um, and helps to draw light right down into the middle. It was kept as simple as possible. Um, uh, this is up on the top floor in the main bedroom, kind of lying on the bed. You can see up into that roof structure. Um, and it's worth noting the clients were very involved in the design process. They both from creative industries um, and they played a key role on the kind of interior design uh, and interior styling. And I think that's that's really critical in the kind of success of the project of how it worked both externally and internally together. Um, and finish on that photo on the outside. There. I've always enjoyed this kind of rear elevation, um, this kind of playful almost haphazard arrangement of the windows that is governed by the original window positions, but just, I, I love the way it kind of uh, looks back out at you. Um, and here we are, these are the clients on the right-hand side of that photo. Um, it was great for us as a practice to get long-listed uh, in House of the Year and get the visit from Kevin McLeod. Um, unfortunately, I was cut from the programme, but I'm not better. Um, so just to wrap up, I'm conscious of time. Uh, a couple of slides I just wanted to say maybe about um, what we see as the wider relevance of the project about reuse. So in very simplistic terms, we were able to you know, retain the foundations that was we calculated about 12.8 cubic metres of concrete. Uh, we were retaining 12 and a half thousand plus bricks and as many of the internal partitions and floors as possible and then wrapping it all around. So uh, the new kind of warm coat we put around the building. Um, we more, almost doubled the area uh, from 125 to 233 square meters. Um, and thermally, we tried to exceed all of the required U values um, to create a very thermally and airtight um, uh, envelope to the building. And we did instruct some uh, energy analysis afterwards because we really wanted to see what the difference it had made. Um, so we kind of were able to calculate it was the difference of about 3.6 cubic tons, uh, sorry, tons of CO2 a year saving from the enhancements that we'd added. 
and just to kind of try and put that into uh, into meaningful numbers, that's about six flights to New York or one petrol car driving for over 19,000 miles uh, to give a sense of what that means um, and the bigger picture. So I'll finish on this slide. I, I've always kind of liked this, this image. It kind of feels like a doll's house almost where you can see into the spaces. And um, I just like the way that you can see and you get a glimpse of, of you know, how the building was put together and you get a sense of the story that lies behind um, the house um, and, and kind of the reveal that, that that has. So I think I'm about out of time. So I'm going to conclude there and hopefully there may be a few questions that come about um, and I can pass back to Smith who may have some questions of her own as well. Hello. Uh, thank you for that, Kristen, and thank you for your excellent timing. Um, so, um, yeah, we've got a couple of questions um, and I'm also going to abuse my privilege and ask a couple of my own as well. Sure. Um, firstly, um, just maybe to pick up on some of the, the points that you made at the end there around um, the kind of reuse of materials and sustainability credentials. Um, one of the things that often comes up in our conversations in the awards panel is obviously there's, obviously there's quite a big time lag between the time when you were doing the design and the point at which we're... Um, giving the award and you mentioned sort of a lot of the stuff happening early in, in like 2017. Mm. Um, and so I was just wanting to ask you like, um, what, um, what would you do differently today um, if you were doing this project now? Um, and uh, have you got any kind of projects on the, on the drawing board as it were, where you're able to do some of those things that you might um, have not had the opportunity to do then? Um. I guess as a quick answer, so, well, I think we'd probably think again or think harder about the, the bricks in a way, because uh, although we retained a lot of bricks, we also put a lot of bricks on. <laughs> um, and obviously that was somewhat driven by the context. But um, some of the projects we're working on now, uh, we're working with some great consultants where we're really uh, at an early stage trying to uh, understand the embodied energy in the materials that are going in in a very kind of uh, empirical and scientific way of just really trying to unpick everything that goes in and so I guess that would be my one yeah or a criticism of it potentially is is the the embodied energy that's probably in, contained within the new bricks that we put around the building um, we could have thought maybe of using brick slips uh, as an idea of it was sort of, sort of being repelled again way brick slips but um, you know I think there, there were ways we could do things differently and, and even down because it is a detached house that the right hand wall the planners insisted that we use brick all the way along there and no one mm. can really see it so things like that i probably would have pushed a bit harder on saying well, that doesn't really make sense um in some respects so i think that's 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 a key thing that with the work we're doing now we're just very much aware of the materials that are going into it yeah i mean thanks for sharing that i think it's really important that we all kind of acknowledge that we're all like on a journey and the conversation is changing a lot and that we can Kind of keep doing more um the other question i wanted to ask was maybe a bit more um policy oriented um i mean i've, I've actually I've, I've i've had the pleasure of visiting this project um and um and yeah. I, I loved it um but i'm also not but, um obviously you learn a huge amount around how we can imaginatively reconfigure our built environment um and just to, it's for an, a really interesting kind of blended family and so on and obviously we're living in with this housing affordability crisis and i was wondering if there's anything in particular that you learned from the project that you would kind of maybe want to see in policy to help us kind of uh, reconfigure our built environment and maybe you know even think about how we have a kind of a, a spatial redistribution of wealth yeah, I mean, it's it's this is a very bespoke project. Uh, it was very much for the family and it was meeting with their brief. And uh, I'm, I'm sure everyone's aware of you know, the privilege of doing a project like this um, is great. But it does. Yeah, there are there's so many conversations, obviously, at the moment of what we can do to our existing housing stock. And I think that's the, the big conversation, isn't it, in terms of what I would like to think of we as a practice is some of the skills we learned from this, but how they may be used on a, on a larger scale. Um, and we get lots of people subsequently come to us saying, oh, I've got this 1970s house or 1950s house, can I do this to it? And it's it's obviously not as simple as that. And there's some great work uh, being done by all sorts of people in terms of studies about, you know, how this could be applied on the scale of a, you know, a housing estate. Um, and I actually live on a kind of a 1970s housing estate. And, you know, you could see, if, if they could be thermally upgraded and we could kind of 
uh, meet some of those same uh, uh, results that we achieved on this in terms of energy improvement, uh, the impact of that. But yeah, the big question, how we do that affordably um, is, yeah, that's a million dollar question <laughs> that we're still working on. Yeah. Sure. Okay. So um, I've got some questions from um, the chat. So a question from Natasha, who says, "Lovely home and projects. Love the window openings. Um, <laughs> what was the what was the biggest constraint of working in a conservation site with such a heavy history?" Um, I think I, I think the key in this instance was engaging with it. Um, not just. I mean, that's fairly obvious. Um, to try and sort of understand your context and and uh, for us in this area particularly it was about engaging with the conservation era society ensuring they kind of supported the approach we were taking um and i think without that then we would have could have fallen foul to the planning system again um you know i think this this project is still it still stops people um as they walk by and it's probably some people still wouldn't Say this is the right approach, um, and you know it's it's subjective. Um, so I think it's just yeah, I trying to engage as much as possible. A, a lot of our projects we do try and you know do direct engagement with uh, local communities, not so much always on residential. But you know I think if if people feeling feel that things are just thrust upon them, they're not going to necessarily be well received. And I think that's that's key to our you know our working practice um, generally. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, also got a question from Scott Thomas, um, who says, um, how did you find having the client as the project manager? Uh, it was, I mean, it was great. I mean, obviously it was a huge undertaking for them. I don't think they'd ever done a project of this scale. They may well be listening into this as well. <laughs> um, but um, it was, it was <laughs> an guess. unusual process. We love it. <laughs> It was it's slightly strange for us having to kind of hand over um, a pack of information and hope that everything, you know, would go smoothly. Uh, I think it's credit to them in terms of how they took on the project. It's credit to the contractors uh, in terms of delivering the project. Um, but we had a great team. I, obviously, I wasn't the only one working on the project. Um, within our practice, we I think we kind of knew we had to deliver a very robust set of information um, and we even did try and give them kind of 3D BIM models that they could use. Um, I think that was a bit beyond them. They stuck to the drawings. But um, fortunately, it, it, from our side, it seemed to run quite smoothly on site. Um, I'm sure the client would uh, sort of have other stories to tell about the complexity of it. But um, yeah, it was a different one for us, not being as involved on site, but um, equally fun to see it happen from afar. Brilliant. Well, look, thanks so much for all of those um, insights. Um, we will be asking Tristan to join us again later, but for now, we're going to go over to our next guest, John Pardy. So sitting on a stunning plot on a bend in the River Thames, the river house is an elevated box um, eroded between the living and sleeping wings to create a partly covered courtyard space. Um, and here's John to tell us all about it. 20 minutes, John. Thank you, Smith. Um... It's called the River House. Uh, it's on the River Loddon, which is a tributary of the Thames. So it's about a kilometer off the Thames. I just want to start with a quick summary of, well, a summary. So I think we made a house as an object floating above its site. We gave it geometry, proportion, and limit to contrast with the nature that surrounds it. It's the linear against the organic, indoors against outdoors. Man set against, against nature. I like to think, perhaps like me, it's got feet on the ground and head in the clouds. And in making the home, I think we created a home that endures seasonal flooding and generates its own power from the sun. We aspire in all our work to speak of time and place and yearn for a little hint of timelessness. Every now and then you get a kind of dream project. Um, houses are difficult, as Tristan would know. It's very, very personal working for individual clients. I met the couple we built this house for nearly four years before they found the site. That in itself was a journey, and it was great because I got to know them. We knew what they were looking for, and slowly they found they'd fall in love with an area just well, on the border of Oxfordshire and um, Berkshire. I'm just timing myself, I forgot that. Um, 
So it's next to Henley on Thames, famous for the regatta. But this is Wargrave. Wargrave is a very low lying area with this river and endless flooding. It's very, very flat, like East Anglia. It's kind of odd when you go off the main road. It's like entering into sort of another world. Um, and the river does flood, not every year. I've built three houses on this same road now, which is extraordinary and lucky. But it does flood a lot, and it's tidal, It's kind of tidal flooding. It comes up, and it goes down the same day. But when it comes up, I'm talking it comes up half a story, like just over a metre, not to be messed about with. So I know when I qualified, I dreamt of you know designing art galleries, libraries, schools, all those things. And after a bit of messing around and 15 years of teaching, I found you know, one small project, which I'd uh, done down on the south coast, just across where I'm sitting now, on the River Bewley in Hampshire. And that was Basil Spence's, the much maligned architect from the 60s. But he built a beautiful little holiday home down on the river. And when I moved down here, escaping London, um, I wrote to the house, and it wasn't long after the house, the house or the owner phoned me, and invited me around. We became friends. I ended up doing the job. That was great. But it got me on the cover of the AJ, and then things turned, and I started getting work. So one of the jobs I'd done after that, I had a phone call from a lady who turned out to be head of BBC Drama. She was absolutely amazing. They just bought a little house in Lodden Drive, which is on the Lodden, um, Tripity. Turns out this is next door to the project I'm talking about now. So when the clients actually said, John, we found the right site, it was amazing that it was next door to one that I'd already done. This house was actually a remodeling, but um, it was fun. And then a few years later, I did another one, which is about 100 meters up the same road, um, called the Hind House. And in this house, I got used to, you know, the battle with the planners. We had a good old battle with the planners. They didn't really care about the design. They cared about the flooding. And to deal with flooding, you have to show that the house that was there resisted the flow of flood water and therefore made it worse. So by elevating it, you can reduce the footprint. Well, on the river house, we reduced it by 95%. And that's the ticket for getting through planning, I think. Unlike um, Tristan's house, we're in the middle of nowhere. It's literally just a sylvan landscape with water, which is fantastic. But you don't know where to start. And the kind of, you've also elevated off the ground. So that also detaches you from context. Nearly everything we work on is related to context. So the only real context I had here was a river where the sun rises, where it sets, where it is at midday. And those are the only things I really had. There's kind of no rules. That makes it actually so much more difficult. So I kind of dig into my head full of passion for architectural history, particularly modern buildings. And it took me back to, of course, the Villa Savoie. Villa Savoie, 1929, undoubtedly the most seminal building of the 20th century for all the ideas it embodied. It captured perfectly a new architecture for the machine age. And yet, I remember in my second year flying from Lyd Airport on a cheesy, cheap trip you know, um, for my studies and actually flew in a Dakota plane, which is amazing. Um, but finally, ending up at Poissy and the Villa Savoie has a big school next to it, which is annoying, but it still sits in its green landscape, detached from the earth. I mean, I loved it. I always loved it. I'd spent a year and a bit being not taught architecture taught the world of Le Corbusier, actually. <clears throat> it was um, almost an indoctrination. But, you know, I fell in love with Corb until I saw this building. You walk up to it, the white, perfect, cubic, modern form is cracked and stained and filthy, and my dream was broken. It was not pure. It was a work of art left out in the rain to decay. And down the way... The bottom left slide is a lesser known house by Jonathan, a man I was later lucky enough to meet and work with him on several books. Um, dangerous meeting your hero, but he was actually divine. This little house called the Middlebow House followed his own property. So in Denmark at that time, young architects could apply for a grant and get a cheap mortgage if they built their own house 
providing it was less than 120 square meters. And the house he built for himself at Halibak, I think is still the one house, if anything, that launched me into the world of architecture in a way that I knew where to go once I'd seen it. It's beautiful, kind of slightly Frank Lloyd Wright. And instead of white render, it was brick and it was timber. All the same ideas, but much more human. The Middlebow House is a precast concrete frame, um, definitely inspired by Chinese architecture. Hudson was obsessed with the idea of systems and building in systems. I kind of landed in my head. Top right is a, another thing that really inspired me through my studies. This is a house for a flower grower um, by Giuseppe Tarangi. Now, Tarangi and his brother were both members of the Italian fascist party in the 40s. In fact, his brother was mayor of Como. So after the war, his work was kind of airbrushed out. We all know Casa del Fascio is a great building, but it's got a different name now. But this little house, when I discovered it, it was through the work, I think it was a PhD written by um, Peter Eisenman of the New York Five. And he called it from object to relationship. And it kind of blew apart the box, juggled with houses that are boxes. So he broke it down into planes, things overlap, and he shifted the dialogue from object to relationship, from not the thing, but the relationship of the things that make it, if that makes sense, it does to me. And then also, I love and still do everything case study house in California, though this one's in Florida by Paul Rudolph. The idea of a simple structure living off the ground, no rules. And then I finally came across the work of a 27-year-old architect for his parents, top right, which is the little house that um, Charles Grathme bought, built for his parents on Long Island. I visited it this a few years back. It's tiny and it looks like concrete, but it's not. It's actually Western red cedar, which goes beautifully silver. And I loved the way it just played around with the box, cut into it, pushed out from it, played with geometry. And it has a kind of perfect timeless quality for me. And to find that Kwathme built another house later, I saw this photograph in a magazine and I thought, ah, got it. It's timber, but it's elegant. You can't get elegant spans generally with timber. It needs to get very fat. So what Kwathme had done and his partner then Siegel had put in a very elegant steel frame into the structure of the building. So the timber does the infill. And that's something I think we've done a lot of since. So the site, I appreciate it's quite dark. First thing you'll notice is the river, which looks very, very brown. It is. And the uh, polytunnels on the right, which, to be honest, they're so low you can't see them. So the site's quite big. The existing house sat on it, plonked in the middle. The one just below the red line is called Cherry 8. That's the house we did before. Rocked up on site, as you do. Very excited to find it was uh, adjoining something else we'd done and the clients moved into this house and stayed there for about six months whilst we figured out what to do. Um, my clients, the, so he is Britain's number one ENT surgeon, absolutely lovely guy. Didn't really want to interfere with his wife's brief because Charlotte, his wife, um, had studied design. Her father was a very well-known, uh, you know, regional sort of, 1960s way architect um, called Gerald Beach. And I'd always admired his work too. He has two great li two listed buildings to his name. One's a house and one's the University of Liverpool um, Sports Pavilion, both great. So they lived in the house and in doing so, they came across a few things about how to live there and what was important. So uh, my idea was to kind of counterpoint nature and what could you do that's floating and I made it very abstract. So it's a single long pavilion. It is long. It's 50 meters long and it's about seven and a half meters deep. Um, and it's arranged on the cardinal points, so east west. So the main face of the building, looking at the river, is due south. I love plans, but they're boring to talk about, so I'll keep this quick. So this long building is divided in two. I have a problem with boxes, I've said that before. So what we did is chopped a hole out of it so that even though you're divorced from the ground because of water and flooding, you have your own little outside space. So there's a little courtyard in the middle, to the right of which is the living spaces, 
the little utility room tucked in the corner, very simple. To the left are studies, plant, all the usual stuff, bedrooms and bathrooms. Tied all together with an enormously long corridor. These guys keep thanking me. They've got so much fitter since they've lived there, running to the kettle in the morning and back to the bed and all of that stuff. Good fun. The staircase comes up on the north side. It lands on a very large um, terrace deck for reasons I'll explain in a minute. And as you arrive, you see straight through the building between it and the chunk that came out of the middle. We've sort of replaced at the top. So Tony's mum was very elderly and... Uh, and well, so was, they built this for her, and it even includes a little um, hydraulic lift, platform lift, so she could get in and out in a wheelchair. Sadly, she died before the house was finished. It's now used as a guest wing, and it, the lift is used for bringing in boxes of wine together. Great fun. Interestingly, when I did the first sketch, the whole house was the other way around. So I naturally always place um, private realm furthest away from the entrance. So from the entrance, you can see the arrow here, you would have arrived and seen the living room, but living on the site, Tony and Charlotte realized that they preferred the views from the Eastern end where the bedroom suite was. They thought I was going to throw my toys out of the pram. I never do. I just thought, yeah, that kind of makes sense. So we flipped the whole house over. It's made in a, this kind of slender steel frame. It was slender. And Tony was a very, very good client. He never once asked or said anything other than, give me a space to sit in at 6 o'clock in the evening for a glass of wine. Day and, you know, every day of the year. So it had to be covered. Wanted it outdoors. We'll come to that. And then when it was actually just about to go on site, they phoned me up and said, can you come and have a chat? We've got something we want to talk to you about. That's always a pleasure with them, so off I went. And he said, John, love it. I don't want any columns in the living room wall. Now the living room wall is nearly 15 meters long. So, uh, and he was absolutely, no question, that's it. Take the columns out. So we did, or rather the engineers, who are momentum, who are fantastic, did some hard work. So you can see it got pretty heavy weather at the right hand over the, over the living room. So that whole roof is cantilevered off the back. Um, clever. I mean, it paid dividends for the view from the living room. I know this is a bit faint, but the section, I was going to say that houses, anybody who does houses know, is all about detail. No matter how good the idea is, it's all about detail, getting everything right. And by everything, I mean everything. You cannot not detail a single tiny connection or, or component if you want it right. It's obsessive. It's incredibly hard work. It takes a lot of labor. So we detail, draw, schedule, and specify everything. The upside to that is once you've done all that work, and it usually takes three or four months, there's no changes. And you've agreed it all with the client, which is brilliant too. So steel frame, infield in TGIs actually, timber sort of trust things, very, very efficient. Insulated the hell out of the whole lot because it's full of air, you can insulate it. Anchored by a great big chimney. I'm obsessed with the idea of a chimney. I know it's difficult now with the emissions, but we had a, a very advanced wood burning stove to complement underfloor heat here. Um, the rest of it's clad in, in larch. The downstairs, we made some fins, brick fins, like the chimney, but not. Those were the service risers. There's just two of those. And each column had a pile underneath it. So every single column's got a pile and the chimney. And that's it. That was the foundations. So it is a gorgeous location. Um, you know, there's two or three projects that stick in my mind. They've all got one thing in common. They just sit in the most divine landscape. Although here you can't and wouldn't use a landscape architect because there's no way you can do anything. It, when it floods, everything's gone. Dero Charlotte did sort of make a little Japanese garden on the ground. It got washed away first, first winter. Uh, it doesn't actually flood every year. I think we went about seven or eight years with no flooding, then it flooded two or three times in a row. Um, 
it's become a little bit of a celebrity joint. Everybody paddleboards past it and stops and tries to photograph it, which is entertaining to watch. So there it is, house with a hole in the middle. The Tarangi thing is where the house is seven and a half meters, but it's actually nine meters wide. So we, because it's south facing, the, the structure and then the folding plane that shades it from solar gain sticks out another meter and a half. And at the same at each end, it sticks out a couple of meters more at each end. So we're up to 54-ish meters long now. It doesn't look so big when you're in it. It does look quite long in photographs, which is kind of fun. We put a balcony off the living room connected down to the, to the garden. The dogs have learned to run up and down there really well. But no balconies off the bedrooms. When we ever we do that, it's quite difficult if somebody's on a balcony because you can walk past all the other bedrooms. So we try to avoid that. Although having the master bedroom now at the west end, which previously we thought it would be at the other end, I think Tony and Charlotte, even though it's kind of behind a gate and screened, when the postman arrives, they can still see it in bed. So they've got these um, containers with plants, which is quite fun. So that's the big overarching... I mean, it's a 50 meter arch in a funny sort of way, though it's not really structuring an arch at all. But the outdoor court, I think, gives it a little magic. It's kind of my favorite space. Whenever you go there, you, you arrive at the front door, you walk through a solid door to be confronted with a glass screen and an outdoors again. I kind of like that inside, outside, don't know where I am bit. Um, they're thinking about maybe putting some awnings in, in the roof space. But there's so much shading, I don't think they need it. They may never do it, I don't know. But very simple palette of materials. Very few bricks, they happen to be Danish, of course. The timber is large. It's clad, well, it's coated with a clear preservative, a clear preservative that goes white over the next couple of years as it oxidizes. They use it in the boating industry. It's beautiful. And in so doing, it sort of abstracts it again. On the entrance, beautiful stair which doesn't touch the floor. It's rather nice. It does, but only with two recessed little pins, something I learned from Arnie Jakobsen. And then there's um, cementitious board for the, the grey panels that infill. So arriving at the top of the stairs, there's the sofa where Tony sits and has his glass of wine at a certain time of day, every, every day of the week, which is brilliant. And you arrive and you look straight through. The door's on your right. It's solid Iroko. You open that, and once again, you're thrown. You're in a glass corridor looking through a glass screen into a courtyard across the water. So that's quite nice. Love all that stuff. There they are, sat indoors. Charlotte's dad died a few years ago. She's got all his oriental rugs from his travels and all his, you know, furniture from Eames to Saarinen, which is nice. And they, they happily live there. It's a long way down to the end, to the to the bedroom at the end. There's some Cabuzier chairs, although I know full well they were designed actually by Charlotte Parand. And no columns in that in that in that living room, which is fun. We only had, I think it was three mil tolerance on the um, structure. If it bent more, those those beautiful panorama doors would not slide. Uh, they have a son who's a, a theatre stage and lighting set designer. So he did the lighting, he's amazing. Um, and look at that single linear LED light that goes 30 meters down the corridor. It's like following your line home. Good if you get pissed. The other thing is the power of dogs, not the film, this one. This little dog's called Minty, it's King Charles Spaniel, it's their dog. And we had a photographer see something of the house who flew in from Australia called Nicole England. And she'd done a book, it's one of the best-selling books, I think, in architecture for years uh, around the world, called Resident Dog. So Minty ended up in Resident Dog. And my goodness, that brings a lot of inquiries. So there you are, got to follow the dog. We've just designed a kennel. Um, we're persuaded to design a kennel, which is being exhibited this weekend in Goodwood. Maybe we'll do more, but it's a case study house kennel, great fun. So this is the house in the, in the, after the flood, the rain. Um, Charlotte busily going home with Minty in the little boat, which is always moored underneath the house. It's fine. The only thing with this is it's really fast flowing. 
So if you put waders on and try and walk in it, you're liable to get knocked over. They know that. They treat it as being a bit like on a cruise liner for a day, maybe a day and a half. Just enjoy the, the ride, watch it flood, watch it go down, clean up, done. We try to make the house as zero maintenance as possible. Um, the timber will look after itself. It will probably need recoating in 10 years. Apart from that, everything's pretty good. Um, the whole thing is on board, ground source heat pump. Uh, it's underfloor heated. The roof is covered in PV, so they're off grid. Now Minty's got a, another little fella joined called Bolly. Not after Bollywood, after um, the champagne, I understand. But nature comes to you. Can't complain at that. So this is a photograph that Nicole England took from Australia. Um, and I'm going to end with a little video, um, which is called On the Waterfront. You may recognise the text from the Marlon Prando 1954 film, On the Waterfront. And I think that's going to be played now. Tony used to read Cambridge he was a keen oarsman and I was brought up in Chester on the River Dee. So there was always water and this area in particular because Tony rode at uh, Henley Royal Ghetto. Every year we'd come, it was, what, from the 1970s wasn't it? Mm. Uh, and it was like being on holiday. It just, you just got this buzz as you drove down the hill into Henley and that was our dream actually to live on the river. This site has the most beautiful uh, sort of flow that goes round it. Um, and I'm sitting here looking due south, shaded. And the water's just reflecting the light up at me. Beautiful. Always the site tells you what to do. And it starts with the sun. The house is lined on the cardinal points, so it's perfectly east-west. So the long side, the south side, faces the river. The river curves around it and flowing. So it's the idea of the linear against the curvy, man against nature. I wanted it to be abstract. So it made this very simple linear form. We're in a floodplain. So we're up on stilts. They're quite narrow steel columns. The whole house is a steel frame. So we reduced the footprint from what was here, which was a house, to almost nothing thereby helping the flood to dissipate quicker. Because it's so long and linear, I did not want it to be a box. I'm not into boxes. And I know that houses are made of bits. So one end of this house is living room where I'm sitting. Then there's courtyard, which breaks it. Then it's the private bits, bathrooms and bedrooms and studies. And there's also a guest room, which is like a, a full stop on the back of it. So I like that idea. It's an assembly of things in very simple forms. So my favourite bit is always walking in the door and seeing the courtyard and the dog running around upstairs. Because the house is on stilts and we're in a floodplain and you're high above the ground, you're almost in the trees and you can, you can see the water going by and you can see the birds, I mean I'm looking at it now, uh, the birds and the wildlife. It's, there's something really magical and dreamy about being here that you actually, I don't want to go anywhere else, I just want to stay here. And because we're high up, we get this lovely light coming through. Thanks so much, John. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, 
And also, right. I just wanted to say, like, I really um, appreciated some of the sort of like really personal um, uh, content there and sort of the relationship with the client that really came across. Um, I want to take this opportunity to ask you a question that I've, yeah, sort of been wanting to, mm, yeah, uh, which is around the kind of like the aesthetic, I guess, implications of designing in a climate emergency. You, um, some, I know that sort of some architects will kind of brush it off as well. It's just a constraint, and all constraints are essentially an you know, opportunity for creativity and, and, and design and so on. But um, I, I appreciated the sort of you know you mentioned things like you know the client is asking for no columns and it's timber but it's elegant, and then even sort of the point around sort of tiny deflections and sliding glass doors and so on. And so I was wondering sort of what what your take on that conversation is, and do you think that we need to evolve kind of aesthetically in order to tackle the, the present emergency context or is there a different way to that we should be thinking of it oh to be honest i don't know i'm not clever enough <laughs> you know what i started off in carpentry and the one thing i learned before i started architecture was you do not waste material so if you get a piece of wood and you cut and throw a bit away you're out it's um <clears throat> deeply ingrained in me really that you shouldn't waste things and yet on the other side, in terms of design, I really value beauty. That might not be very fashionable, but I think truth and beauty are, as John Keats said, the, the key to greatness, not personal greatness, but buildings that endure. And if they're gonna endure, they've gotta be beautiful. But even more importantly, I think sustainability in my head is very much linked, not just to the things you shouldn't waste and do, but to creating buildings that succeed. If buildings succeed and they're used a lot, they're inherently sustainable, particularly in public realm, not less so in the domestic. But I would kind of think that's really important. I hope so. Um, but then this house, you know, it cost a lot of money to put in. Great big boreholes, 150 meters down into the earth, all the PVs to take it pretty much, well, it is off grid. So I think kind of the client didn't want it to be a burden, nor did I. So pretty much every house we do now, we do that little formula of PVs, heat pump, let it work itself out. Um, that's that's all we do, I think. Um, have you has the conversation around embodied carbon changed your sort of design thinking at all? I really do defer to the more clever engineers we work with on that one. I mean, I try to be you know into everything, but you can't. You got to special. No, I know that I know the principles. Um, you're a very clever girl. You're a structural engineer as well. Look at this. But, you know, I'm not. I'm just um, kind of slightly obsessed at doing what I do. And treat every project, you raise the bar. Certainly the whole climate thing here is writ large, you know. Mm. A lot of people say, well, why have you raised it up so much? So actually it floods one in a hundred year prediction or thousand year now. It floods up to 1.05 meters. That's waist height. Yeah. But we thought that's, that's wasteful. So if we push it up two meters or 2.2 as it is here, at least you can use it to park under or put equipment under or have a barbecue under, which indeed they do. So I think that's quite good as well. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I also just, I wanna combine a, a question that we've had in the chat um, with uh, another one of mine. Um, so uh, Carolina, um said a uh, beautiful house and dreamy brief yeah. um and um i have a question about its long-term use how does the design incorporate or deal with rising water levels due to climate change and i guess i just wanted to add on to that as well obviously you've um been working in and around this site for a really long time you have a really kind of deep sense of that waterfront mm. site and i was wondering like how might we approach the design for waterfront communities that weren't built to be on a waterfront as sort of sea levels rise how can we kind of mm -hmm. adapt sites to be sort of new waterfront living yeah that's a really tricky one i've had quite a lot of people ask me to look at these things there's no easy answer yeah. so nearly all the properties along this river are being knocked down and rebuilt a lot of them are built off the ground but not far enough so we know that if we if the scientists have got it right that water will never flood our building We've already doubled the distance. So God forbid it's worse than that. We just need to build an arc if it is, isn't it? But I, I think when you've got existing communities, you've got to abandon the ground floor and somehow reinforce it so it doesn't get washed away. 
water is very heavy when it's flowing. Um, so that's one way, and then build above that. It's possible. But there are a lot of places. I had a company in Calgary in Canada say, help me, and I couldn't. <clears throat> if those buildings are there, and they've all got, you know, built off the ground, you've got to start again, which you can't, or think about repurposing the ground floor, which you can. Yeah. Yeah, I suppose it's a, it brings a whole different level to the kind of retrofit conversation. And it really does. Yeah. seen like projects of people like <laughs> jacking up existing buildings and sort of all sorts. So, yeah. um, but your question is right. I had a dreamy brief. I had dreamy clients. <laughs> Once in a while you get them. And I've been lucky lately. They are, they were amazing. That's fantastic. Right. Tristan, would you like to join us? Um, we've got just a, a couple more minutes before Hi. we want to go back to the calls. Um, Tristan, did you did you want to maybe add anything around kind of designing for a ch changing climate, sort of not only thinking about the kind of mitigation, but also the climate resilience point? Are there ways in which the house within a house or sort of other projects that you've got on where you're thinking about how to um, change for uh, design for sort of more extreme weather conditions and so on? Um, yeah, I mean, it's complex, um, as John says, and the policies are changing, the regulations are changing, so it's it's a moving playing field. Um, I think generally as a practice, we try and keep the conversations as broad as possible um, and just really trying to think, you know, from first principles, really. Um, we're starting to work on some kind of passive house projects now, and I think that's guiding a lot of our thinking of kind of the way in which we approach our detailing. Um, but yeah... It, I don't think there's a magic bullet for how we can predict exactly what's going to happen, but it's obviously that change has to happen. Um, and certainly a lot of our projects have involved retrofit or reuse in some way. Um, and certainly it doesn't make things easier doing that. Um, and it was very interesting, actually, I think comparing uh, your talk, John, with with our project is obviously they're so very different um, in terms of a lot of our projects are in very tight urban grain um, where you're kind of cheek by jowl up against each other. And and I think that's a, what's so nice is looking at the two projects side by side and um, the different constraints that they had to deal with. I've meandered off topic there completely. Um, but, yeah, it's a challenge and uh, we are enjoying trying to do what we can in approaching that. Sure. Um, we have a question from Tim that I'd like to ask both of you, which is, um, with your incredible experience, what advice would you give to young architects trying to capture this level of project and client? Hmm. Will I answer that? Uh, I'll let you start, John. <laughs> <laughs> I've kind of... I always say the same thing. And it's something I borrowed from... I think the great Glenn Merkert. So when I qualified, I got a bit bored working for other people and decided I couldn't do it. I went over to Australia to see if I could get a job there and I did and met Glenn Merkert. I was the first person from the UK to seek him out. I just fell in love with the house I'd seen of his. And he offered me a job, which I couldn't eventually take because by the time I got back from Australia, I had won two competitions and you know what it's like, sliding doors. But he said these words, he said, tough it out. So he said for the first 12 project houses, he built. He had 12 appeals. 12 times he had to take the car off the road because he couldn't afford the road tax, put it on bricks. 12 times he put it back on the road as they won each appeal. And I thought, bloody hell, that guy's durable. So if you're going to be, if you're going to do something you want to do, you've got to suffer for it. I spent 15 years postgrad teaching because I wasn't prepared to do anything other than hang on for what I wanted to do. It wasn't arrogance, it was just stubbornness, I think. But, you know, if you hang in there and keep learning, you know, why not? It just takes time. But I didn't compromise on the road. I'm kind of proud of that. I think for ourselves, um, I mean, we started small. Um, you know, you take anything you can. Mm. Um, with every project we look at, you try and see whether it's kind of satisfying your desire to, to, to solve problems um, and then really once you get a client who's willing to trust you to deliver their project it's 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 so, delivering domestic houses is I think such a hard task in terms of it's it's you're all in it's very emotional because you're being entrusted to you know deliver someone's home where they're going to live in it um, so yeah it can be emotionally draining but um, yeah you keep going really um, and uh, get through the other end. 
No, you're absolutely right. It's so intense, you know, forming personal relationships. It's not, it's not got commercial fees either, but you can make it work. And it's such a joy. I mean, when you do it and you build a home, not a house, it becomes a home, as you've done, Tristan. You know what mm -hmm. it's like? You walk in and have a glass of wine with them. Mm -hmm. think, oh, I did something. That's really nice. Yeah. And you're still talking to each other at the end of it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Right. Well, um, much as I would still like to be us for us to be still be talking to each other, um, <laughs> oh, that was smoother in my head. Um, <laughs> unfortunately, we do have to um, we do have to close close now. Um, thank you so much to both Tristan and John for sharing those stories, and uh, I think it's really important to take away that message there that it's it's really about people. Um, and building homes, not houses, I think is also really important. Um, now, uh, I have to say that Building Stories will be back after the Jubilee holidays on Tuesday the 7th of June, and it's another in-person event in the evening um, at Portland Place. Um, RBA President Simon Olford will be hosting the event, and it's a double headliner featuring two more fabulous award-winning projects, Windermere Jetty by Carmody Grok and the Key Worker Housing in Edmonton by Stanton Williams. Most importantly, um, the bar will be open from 6 p.m. <laughs> so please do come and join us for a drink and you can sign up for tickets by following the link in the chat. So thank you, everybody. Thank you for having me as your guest host. And uh, yeah, see you next time. Thank you. Thanks very much.